The plant kingdom is immense. At least 400,000 species of flowering plants, herbs, shrubs, vines, grasses, ferns, mosses, trees, palms, and algae are known from across our world. The very earliest plant fossils are 800 million years old, and some authorities believe plants emerged even far earlier. Today, plants surround us, but I think it's fair to say we often take them for granted. Plants grow in virtually every habitat on Earth, from the lush jungles of the humid tropics to the driest deserts on the planet, where criver trees can survive for years without rain by way of highly drought-adapted leaves and heat-reflecting bark. Through such extreme adaptations, even desert dunes may become gardens. Plants can flourish on the summits of mountains, thousands of meters above the clouds, and at the polar ends of our world, where temperatures may only be warm enough for plants to grow for just a few weeks each year. But despite this, tundra plants may produce spectacular cushions of color to attract the few pollinators that occur. Some plants and algae form forest-like groves under the waves, while others can grow on bare rock, such as algae forming part of lichens. It's not just that plants have adapted to the different ecological conditions on Earth, but that plants can evolve together to form highly adapted ecosystems that are specialized to local conditions, such as the unique spiny forests of Madagascar, complete with thousand-year-old baobab trees and spiny pachypodiums. By defining the vegetation that occurs, plants also define what animal species may be locally supported. Plants can literally transform the landscape of our world. Within just a few years, the barren and sterile ash slopes of a recently erupted volcano can be turned green and filled with life. All of this happens because plants have the unique ability to turn sunlight into energy through their leaves. No animal has this special trait. As such, either directly or indirectly, plants provide food for every animal on Earth, including all of the crops that we eat and all of the oxygen we breathe. Without plants, the world's soils would quickly degrade, our civilization would collapse, and we could not survive. A few species of plants have changed very little for tens of millions of years and appear virtually identical to fossils. Others evolved more recently and continue to diversify to exploit new pollinators. Still to this day, no one really knows how many types of plants there are on Earth. This is because new species of plants continue to be discovered. And some of these new discoveries seem to defy belief such as the Darth Vader begonia, found only a few years ago, and so called for its striking leaf coloration. Plants include the most massive living things on Earth. The giant redwood trees can tower over 100 meters tall and weigh over 2,000 tons. The lives of plants can operate on different scales to the lives of animals in the deserts of Namibia, where witcher plants can live for thousands of years. It's believed that centuries may sometimes pass before conditions are wet enough to enable the seeds of Wawichia to germinate and grow. But Wawichia is not the longest living plant. These trees, the bristlecone pines, can live even longer lives. These are the longest living organisms on Earth, and a single tree may grow for over 5,000 years. 
so the very oldest of these bristlecone pines sprouted before the Great Pyramid of Egypt was even built. And they're still alive. We often think of plants as passive green objects that grow silently. But plants exploit animals to fertilize their flowers and to distribute their seeds, and sometimes even for defense. For example, these ant plants that have hollow insides that provide specialist breeding chambers for ants. The ants then defend the plant if it's eaten by a herbivore. Sometimes it's not clear who the master is in this relationship. Some plants take their relationships with animals even further and deceive insects. This plant is the stuff of nightmares. It's called rhizanthes, and it mimics the body of a dead animal to attract carrion flies that lay their eggs. The flies inadvertently pollinate the flower, but once the eggs hatch, the resulting maggots starve and die. A few plants parasitize other plant species, such as giant Rafflesia blooms and their less well-known relatives, Sapria and Balanophora. All of these steal all of the energy that they need from host vines that they infect. Other plants are not just thieves, but murderers. Strangler figs kill other trees by constricting them. Then they absorb the nutrients from their victims' rotting remains. And a few plants turn the tables on animals and eat insects and creatures as big as rats. Sensitive plants have leaves that move not for eating animals, but for defense. This plant is called Mosa pudica, and it's the most widespread sensitive plant of all. If you touch its leaves once, they fold together. If you touch it a second time, the branches bend downwards, and the leaves are then hidden from any herbivore that wants to eat them. This plant is really easy to grow at home. All you need is some standard potting compost. Sensitive plants really aren't that fussy in the compost in which they grow, so a standard mix is absolutely fine. You need a few little pots, about this sort of size is absolutely fine, and just gently fill up the pots with the compost. Just firm it down a little bit, but don't compact it too much, because the plant's roots have to then penetrate down into the soil. Then just sprinkle it a little bit of water on the top like that, so your compost is nice and wet, and you're ready to go. The seeds, these are the little seeds here, they actually need to be soaked in water for one to two hours before they're planted, and these are some that we already soaked, so they're ready to use. Just get two or three in a pot about this size, and gently pop them on the top like that. You can either leave them just sitting on the surface of the pot, or you can sprinkle a little bit of soil on the top and just compact it down. If you do that, don't put too much soil in because if they're too deep down in the compost, the little plants, the little seedlings won't be able to reach the surface. Then put your pot on a sunny, warm windowsill and preferably in a propagator. If you don't have a propagator, you can make your own. They're really, really easy to make. All you need to make a propagator is a see-through drinks bottle like this. About two liters is absolutely perfect. Get an adult to help cut two sections Make sure the top section is bigger than the bottom so that the plants have lots of room to grow. Then all you need to do is make two cuts a few centimeters big in the bottom section here. You can then put your pot inside your propagator. Just be really careful because the edges can be pretty sharp. And then you're ready to go. Make sure you put a bit of water in every few days so the compost stays nice and wet, but don't flood it that can actually be harmful for the seedlings and plants. So just make sure it's wet. The really clever thing about this DIY propagator is that you can actually control the amount of humidity and the temperature inside by just taking the lid off. So it makes a perfect little recycled DIY chamber in which to grow seedlings and your sensitive plants will love it. In a couple of weeks you should start to see some little seedlings emerge and you'll have plants growing pretty quickly.